Logo fades into view. New York Association on Independent Living. Thank you to our 2022 webinar series sponsor, Waymo. All right, it looks like we've got uh, most people in the room. It's one o'clock on the dot. So I'm going to just do a brief introduction and get us started. Uh, just a few technical pieces. Um, we do have closed captioning available. So uh, you can see in the um, bottom uh, tab, you should be able to turn closed captioning on. Uh, we have uh, we will have Q&A at the end of the pre presentation, so you can use the Q&A function along the bottom to put your questions in throughout the presentation and we'll answer them at the end. Uh, we also can allow folks to raise their hand and unmute you at the end uh, during the Q&A session. And of course, I want to thank our uh, webinar series sponsor Waymo uh, for their sponsorship. Today's webinar is uh, Introduction to Disability Rights New York. Uh, DRNY is New York State's Protection and Advocacy System and Client Assistance Program. They're federally funded to provide free legal representation directly to people with disabilities and to monitor and investigate allegations of abuse and neglect. Um, both Niall and the IL Network have worked closely with DRNY you know, throughout the years on advocacy issues and individual uh, systems, uh, you know, uh, complaints. Um, I think there's a lot of new people in the IL network. I know DRNY has a lot of new staff as well. So Jen and I thought that this would be a good opportunity to kind of reintroduce DRNY, um, their role and the issues that they're working on and the various programs within uh, the agency. Uh, so we're joined by Jennifer Monthy, who is the legal director for DRNY. Uh, prior to being legal director, she held several other positions within the agency including statewide director of several of the programs, which we'll learn more about today. And I'm not gonna name them because it comes with a lot of acronyms that Jen is gonna uh, get into. Um, Jen practices in the areas of education, community integration, and civil rights of individuals with disabilities, and is a founding member and current chairperson of the New York State Special Education Task Force. Uh, so thank you, Jen, for joining us, and I'll let you share your screen and get started. Well, thank you for that introduction. Introduction. Let me uh, share my screen. Um, and does that? Can you just do a check with me? Does that look like the full screen to everybody? Oh, I have a thumbs. Okay. So, um, well, thank you for uh, inviting me to speak with you today. Um, as Lindsay said, my name is Jennifer Monthe, and I'm the legal director at Disability Rights New York. Uh, I'm going to uh, try to deal with all of the acronyms that Lindsay avoided in the introduction. Uh, but to start with um, uh, disability, I'm going to talk to you about um, who we are at Disability Rights New York. Um, just a little bit about kind of our mission and our um, our values is that we advocate for New Yorkers with disabilities to enable them to exercise their own choices, to participate in their communities, and to enforce their civil and legal rights. Uh, we uh, do this through uh, what's called the Client Assistance and Protection Advocacy Programs. The, uh, this is a federally funded program uh, to provide a variety of different types of services which include um, giving individuals and um, their loved ones information and referral services. Uh, we investigate allegations of abuse and neglect. We monitor uh, programs where people receive services. We per pursue legal, administrative, or other types of remedies as, um, as the legal component of our practice. And we have the authority to educate uh, policymakers about issues that impact New Yorkers with disabilities and we coordinate um, our advocacy with other agencies. So that is like the broad brush of, of what we are. I wanna go through each of these uh, programs and try to dispel the acronym, spell out the acronyms for you. I've uh, organized the presentation in, um, in chronological order from when the programs were created um, up until the present. So the first program that we operate um, was created in 1980, uh, uh, was established, well, I'm going to start with the Client Assistance Program, which was established in 1984. Um, this program is different from our protection advocacy programs. 
Uh, the the um, program focuses on assisting people with um, accessing and receiving rehabilitation services. This is done in New York State through two vocational rehabilitation um, agencies, Access VR and the Commission for the Blind. So when uh, anyone applies for those type of services and they are, you know, or having difficulty applying or receiving services from those agencies, our client assistance program um, provides individual advice and um, and sorry, I don't know why my slides are automatically moving, individual advice and also direct representation. Another component of the client assistance program is to um, to assist people who are having uh, difficulty accessing services from the federal independent living um, centers. So um, if there are complaints that they are unable to receive services, the client assistance programs review those complaints and often work very closely with um, the ILCs to resolve those concerns. The first protection and advocacy program was created in 1975 by Congress. It was uh, created after the Willowbrook State School scandal and the Geraldo Rivera expose. Right after those images, those horrific images were seen in our, um, on our TVs, Congress decided to uh, hold hearings. At the conclusion of those hearings, Congress determined that the states across the country were not able to sufficiently oversee the care that people with disabilities were receiving in uh, state um, and operated programs. And so it created the first protection and advocacy program. And this was directed to people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. The program had two functions and still operates under those two functions. One, they were given access uh, to investigate allegations of abuse and neglect within the facility and to monitor those service providers within the state. This access is very broad so that um, service providers uh, must let in the protection advocacy system unannounced to see what's happening within the facilities. It includes the right to speak to anyone within that facility to get access to records of anybody who receives services in the facility and to take uh, pictures, photographs, and conduct an investigation um, of the facility. It also gives broad access to educate people with um, disabilities and their care providers about their rights and the protection advocacy system. I'm just going to pause for one second because I see the captioner has their hand up. Is there something that we need? All right, well, I'm not getting a response, but if I need to stop, please, please interrupt me. Um, and if the captioning isn't working, please interrupt me. Uh, the, the second function of the protection advocacy system was to provide direct representation or advocacy to um, people with disabilities who um, were in these service systems. Uh, so you can imagine that one is an investigative role to make sure that that services are being delivered by the state um, entity appropriately. And the second was to provide that free direct representation to people with disabilities. And that system has been in place since 1975. Shortly after the program for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities was created, Congress also received complaints about people with um, mental illness who are in um, state um, psychiatric centers. And the same conditions that existed for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities were um, were happening in state psychiatric centers. And so Congress expanded the protection advocacy program to individuals with mental illness. It was created in 1986 and um, it is um, operated through the um, Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, which um, the acronym is SAMHSA, S-A, 
M H S A. Our federal government very much likes acronyms. We, uh, under that program, the same authority was given to the protection advocacy system, a investigation and monitoring authority and an individual representation authority. After the creation of these two programs in the um, in the 70s and 80s, there was a gap, right? So we have protection for people who have um, who have uh, intellectual developmental disabilities, protection for people who have mental illness, but there are a variety of other people who were um, still being subjected to abuse and neglect and needed advocacy that were not protected. And so Congress in 1993, um, expanded the Rehabilitation Act to include the Protection Advocacy for Individual Rights Program, or what we call the PEAR program. And it, it directed that anyone that was not eligible as a person with an intellectual or developmental disability or a mental illness could receive protection from the, um, from the state's protection advocacy system, uh, like they were, would have if they were qualified for those other two programs. Um, I'll pause here for just a second to let you know that um, while the states uh, were not required to set up these systems, if they wanted to receive the federal funding, often the Medicaid funding that went along with delivering services to people with disabilities, they were required to designate a program within each one of the states. So today, there is a protection and advocacy system within every state and territory of the country. The way in which the system is designated is either the governor or the authority in a territory um, gets to select the system. And unless there is good cause, that um, protection advocacy system stays in place. So for many states, that protection and advocacy system has existed since the creation of the program in the 1970s. The majority of those um, protection advocacy systems are nonprofits, but there are a few state agencies that still exist across the country that serve as the protection advocacy system. After the PEAR program was created, uh, the protection advocacy for assistive technology program was created in um, 1998, um, and this uh, was kind of the first example of where Congress wanted to target advocacy at a particular need. So it was seeing concerns with access to assistive technology and um, a lack of legal ed education and legal advocacy that was available to people who are being denied assistive technology within the states. And so um, while a person, every person would be um, covered under those three larger programs, um, that I just described, Congress targeted resources towards people seeking assistive technology. In um, 1999, when the Ticket to Work and Work Incentive Act was amended, Congress then looked to the protection advocacy system again and um, created the um, Protection Advocacy for Beneficiaries of Social Securities Program called PABS. The um, Social Security Administration um, is who oversees this program, and the purpose is to um, assist people with barriers to employment if those individuals receive Social Security disability benefits or SSI benefits. Um, this includes assisting with vocational rehabilitation um, advocacy, employment barriers, or anything that prevents a person from securing, retaining, or regaining employment. Then in 1996, the Traumatic Brain Injury Act was passed after when there was a reauthorization of the Children's Health Act in 2000. Um, the PATP program, which is Protection and Advocacy for Individuals with Traumatic Brain Injury was created Again, seeing a gap in um, wanting to, from Congress's perspective, target um, people with traumatic brain injury. Um, this program provides all the same type of assistance that um, our individual rights program does, our PEAR program, or our, um, 
our, our IDD program, our mental health program, things like information referral services, individual uh, family advocacy, legal representation, and um, assistance with self advocacy. Finally, the um, the last two programs, one was created in 2002, which um, uh, was added with the Help America Vote Act, um, is our PAVA program, which is Protection and Advocacy for Voter Access. Um, there, the, the program is um, uh, targeted on um, trying to assist people to vote. Uh, and um, uh, many of the programs look at barriers on both the the day of voting, as well as anything that presents barriers up to the day of voting. And the most recent program that was created, the acronym is PARP, P-A-R-P, and that is the Protection Advocacy for Beneficiaries of Social Security Benefits who have representative payees. That one is a long name. Um, it was created um, by Congress uh, to oversee a um, uh, the representative payee program. So if a person receives Social Security benefits and they're not able to direct those benefits, they, um, in order to receive it, need to have someone else designated, which is called a representative payee, to manage their funds. Um, and as a result of um, concerns about ab financial abuse for those individuals, um, Congress um, designated um, $25 million to expanding the protection advocacy system. Um, and this program goes and reviews um, mostly um, institutional beneficiaries, larger corporation beneficiaries that serve people um, with disabilities, but also some individual um, beneficiaries as well. Um, they, they are able to have broad access to um, all of the financial records of the representative payee, um, and they have kind of stringent guidelines to ensure that people um, are not being uh, abused. I'll, I'll, I'll pause here to give kind of an example. So, for example, um, people who are residing in nursing facilities, often that nursing um, facility will be the beneficiary's um, representative payee. And it has uh, quite a lot of control of their finances in that role. Um, and through the, the PARP program, we were able to, in one circumstance, identify concerns that create um, the, well, the financial management of the people within a particular uh, nursing facility. Um, we were also able to, during those reviews, discover other health and safety concerns within the facility. And as a result of that, um, uh, access and investigation, we were able to um, um, uh, protect those individuals in a facility. Some of the facilities um, do not operate anymore, and individuals um, were able to get advocacy from us to um, transition out of the nursing facility back to their um, preferred uh, community um, living arrangement. So I, I do want to talk now about, now that you understand that these programs exist, I want to talk about DRNY's services. So uh, as I said to you earlier, uh, DRNY um, uh, uh, became the designee of, um, well, I told you earlier that the, the governor makes a designation of the Protection and Advocacy and Client Assistance Program. DRNY um, uh, became the designee um, for the statewide program in 2011. Uh, prior to that, New York State operated this system under um, a state agency. Uh, some of you may recall the Commission on Quality of Care. Uh, and then that state agency contracted with law offices across the state to provide the legal arm of the system while retaining the um, investigation and monitoring uh, within the state agency. There was an audit in 2011 of New York's system and the federal oversight agencies concluded that the state agency that delivered the service was an independent enough of the state deliverer of service, which is a key component of the protection advocacy system, because if you want to, um, as uh, as Congress directed, have oversight of a state agency, you certainly don't want there to be 
um, a connection between the, the place delivering the services and the person, the place investigating that service. Um, as a result of that audit, New York State redesignated the protection advocacy system. Um, and as an, just an example of how kind of un, um, that unique that is, that's not really only been done in the history of the PNA system a handful of times, oftentimes from a state agency to a nonprofit, um, but rarely from one nonprofit to another nonprofit. Um, so DRNY had been providing protection advocacy services under the, our incorporated name, Disability Advocates Inc since 1997 and that legal arm um, was the advocacy that we did providing direct advocacy and systemic advocacy to people with disabilities um, but as we became the state designee we expanded and we um, uh, had uh, created physical office spaces prior to the pandemic in albany rochester and brooklyn we now have staff kind of uh, scattered across the state as a result of the pandemic um, but we we became the designee and uh, have a responsibility of a statewide service. Our services um, are consistent with the things that I told you about the protection advocacy system. We provide direct legal representation to people with disabilities. Um, we engage in that legal representation with the person with the disability um, to the greatest extent that they can direct our legal representation. That includes anything from children with disabilities up through um, adults with disabilities. We have um, uh, relationships with um, family members and loved ones where we will provide them technical assistance or um, direct them to other type of resources. But our goal is to really um, create a relationship with the individual with the disability um, as we provide that legal representation. We also, a large component of our uh, work is to do systemic advocacy. We often do that through what, what we call law reform litigation, where we bring either a litigation on behalf of a class of people or through our name as Disability Rights New York to try to uh, affect change. We also do that through policy advocacy as well. Um, our, uh, our role of investigating and monitoring to protect people from abuse and neglect some of the monitoring may result in public reports that identify serious concerns that need to be addressed and through that type of advocacy we um, can get the reform that systemic reform that we're looking for a large part of our work is also about education educating like i'm doing today about what the protection advocacy system is but also educating policymakers, educating um, individuals with disabilities about their rights um, educating family members about how they can support and um, uh, people to enforce their rights. We do um, that through uh, these type of trainings as well as outreach. Uh, we participate in statewide um, outreach. Um, we have a commitment to go to every county of in the state uh, to um, to educate that those uh, those different communities, including rural communities, about the services that we provide. And we also have a robust information and referral. So if you contact um, our office, your, um, your legal issue is reviewed by a lawyer. Um, we have a intake system that um, our commitment is to the extent the person wants to communicate via a telephone, that they're speaking to a live person. We do not have a intake hour or our intake is shut off for the month. Anybody who's contacting us is is having their case assessed um, in 2020 we uh, responded to over 3000 requests for service um, a, a little over a thousand of them were providing that information and referral service and the remaining 2000 a little over 2000 was um, i'm sorry a little over a thousand was full case service and a little over 2000 was the referral um, and information service all of our services are free and all of the um, advice that we give is confidential. I shared um, in here, I'm not sure what's going to happen when I click, so I'm going to come back to this, our annual report, and I can show that to you. I can also share the slides with you so you can see them. You can see from this, um, our 2020 numbers, this is the type of service that we 
provided to individuals. Not This doesn't include our systemic work. This includes the amount of individual assistance. You can see that 24% um, of it were about obtaining or maintaining um, benefits. A lot of that is information and referral service. Many people reach out to us um, saying that they've lost Medicaid benefits or they've lost um, uh, access VR benefits or they've lost Social Security benefits. Where do I go in order to get those benefits back? Um, the other, um, there's 15% for employment and 15% for housing issues. Um, that This was, again, um, 2020 um, was a pandemic. Um, and barriers to employment and concerns about housing was obviously high on our client um, concerns at that point. That's anything from requesting an accommodation from a housing provider um, or an employer, sorry, I'm gonna go back here, to, um, uh, to, how, to how to access housing um, that is accessible already to, um, to um, you know, any other barriers that, that a person may face in, in getting um, employment. So I don't have a accessible vehicle that I can use. How do I get access to that type of a vehicle? Um, those are barriers to employment. Uh, we also do um, a great deal of educational work. That's anything from early childhood um, education up through um, um, post-secondary education. So that could be special education for school-age children. That could be um, uh, accommodation requests or um, tuition assistance um, from uh, for higher education. Um, the home and community-based service issue um, 4% of that were for individual cases, but that, that becomes the largest amount of our um, systemic advocacy. So many of the issues that we found with community-based services through our agencies that deliver these services present systemic problems that we're often dealing with on either a policy level or by filing litigation against the state. Uh, we also do um, individual advocacy under self-determination. One of the most robust practices um, that we have on self-determination is barriers that people face because they're placed under guardianship. So we do, um, uh, it's, it's actually very time consuming work of restoring people from guardianship so that they um, can um, once again make decisions um, and, and um, about how and where they want to live um, their lives. Um, and uh, another portion of the slide, you can see 7% is about accessibility. Um, there are a variety of things that fall within this category from um, sidewalks not being accessible to, um, to public locations not being accessible to courthouses not being accessible. Um, that, that, um, that is kind of a broad um, category. I put at this last slide um, the contact us. Um, but I did, that's, so that's my last slide, but I did want to talk about um, going, flipping back through some of these programs, thought it might be helpful um, before we turn to the Q&A to describe some of the um, things, um, highlights of things that we do under the program to give you a little bit more flavor of how we operate these programs. I thought the best way to do that might be to show you this annual report, but if it doesn't come up, what I'm going to do is simply if you guys can't see it, I'm going to simply kind of walk through it. So if you bear with me one second. Um, I'm going to stop sharing and I'm going to share a new screen if that's okay with everybody. Can everybody see this here? Yeah. Okay, good. I'm going to just flip through to one of the programs and this will be available to to you. Um, but uh, the CAP program, I told you that this is um, uh, a program where we um, help people who are seeking, receiving, or been denied services from our state vocational rehabilitation agencies. You can see here an example. Um, we're often contacted by people who are, are finding barriers to accessing the education that they might need in order to get to employment. And that's one of the key functions that our VRA agencies fund is access to education. And so um, the, the person in this case was an individual that wanted to become a social worker. Um, and 
uh, we needed to represent them through an administrative review to um, to ensure that the VR agency was willing to fund that goal. Um, and as a result of our advocacy, we were able to get a, a favorable decision and the person was able to get funding for one year masters of social work program from Columbia University. Um, and so that's an example of the type of individual advocacy that we might engage in under the client assistance program. An example of the, the systemic advocacy that we're currently involved in, um, I think many, many of you might have um, been receiving some of these complaints about the, the VR agencies not um, funding accessible vehicles, which is a barrier to people getting into employment. Um, right now, our VR agencies operate under a, um, um, an outdated policy. Um, and what I mean by that um, is that many of the vehicles that they uh, approve for modification are not being produced anymore by the vehicle manufacturers. Um, and the vehicles that would be um, able to be modified um, are not approved under that policy. And so we, we started seeing this downward trend of vehicles, um, the number of vehicles being approved um, shrinking and the number of clients that are being denied increasing. Um, we uh, attempted to resolve it through an administrative hearing, um, but the administrative hearing officers have allowed the VR agency to rely upon the policy to deny access to this service for several years. Now that the vehicles are sort of not being produced anymore, we, we did a FOIL request. We actually wanted to know how many approvals. And um, while the VR agencies gets hundreds of requests, um, the approvals in the last few years have been um, a couple handfuls of, of people. And so that's a significant problem. After we started engaging in some of that um, systemic look at the problem, the VR agencies contacted us and our clients and said that they are um, reversing their position that the policy needs to be fo followed. And they are starting to approve vehicles that are in, are not in their policy while they amend their policy. Um, so we're taking a really close look at that. We want to make sure it's not just our clients that are benefiting from that change in policy. Um, so if you are seeing people who are continuing to be denied access to um, vehicle modification, I encourage you to reach out to us and let us know that that's happening so that we can um, make sure that it is being addressed systemically for all of um, New Yorkers. Um, our AT program does a lot of work um, with accessibility, public accessibility, whether it is, this is an example of some advocacy that we did with the CDTA, um, where we, um, we got a more effective complaint process in place um, when, um, when the CDTA was um, discriminating against a person with a disability. Um, but other work that we do in the AT program, some active work that we're doing, um, we filed a lawsuit against um, New York City for a particular Bronx neighborhood where um, our clients were not able to actually navigate off the street that they live on because um, the curb cuts were often blocked by cars and the sidewalks had things um, like tents or other things on them that prevented people from navigating around them without entering into the, the busy street. Um, this was happening around a hospital um, and during the pandemic, the city permitted greater parking in that area, which increased the amount of cars that were in that neighborhood um, and cars began to illegally park quite frequently and blocked in um, our clients. In one case, they blocked them in during a health emergency, which prevented them from exiting um, the street um, uh, timely. Um, and in other times, they really do have to kind of take their lives in their hands and enter street traffic in order to navigate around the barriers. Um, so that's an example of our work within our AT program. Um, our PABS program um, did a lot of work in 2020 uh, around the unemployment assistance. Um, and ensuring that people understood what um, uh, benefits they were entitled to during that period of time. It was a busy time for beneficiaries um, and there continues to be work that needs to be done to um, encourage people to return to the workforce. And um, that is kind of the focus of that program. 
Um, I do want to highlight that in order to be eligible for this program, a person has to be under the age of 65 and they have to be receiving SSI or SSDI. So it is a targeted program. Um, any other employment barriers that a person might have if they fall outside of that criteria would go to one of our other programs. Um, so I still encourage people to contact us. I just want to just make clear what this program is about. Um, our, our program for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities is one of the larger programs that we have here. During the pandemic, we turned very quickly to looking at concerns within uh, group homes operated or funded by our state agency. Um, and we found some serious and sort of alarming health concerns within these um, settings. Um, many of them were, um, were not provided um, personal protective equipment, PPE, during the pandemic. And people with intellectual and developmental disabilities were one of the hardest hit um, by the pandemic with um, four times the number of people with intellectual and development disabilities died as compared to the general population. Um, we collaborated on this investigative report with other nonprofit agencies like New York Lawyers for the Public Interest, New York Civil Liberties Union. We identified the problems. And as a result, um, our state legislature held hearings. They identified um, the, the state's failure to respond um, their emergency management plan being inadequate in this case. Um, and we're hoping that this um, work will help prevent what happened during the early stages of COVID um, if, we, if we're faced with a um, similar health crisis in the future. Um, our mental health program has um, done a variety of work as well with investigations. And um, this uh, report highlights one of them, which was the use of restraint chair chairs in New York um, County jails, which is a concern. Um, as a result of this, we are seeing um, uh, counties move away from uh, this use, some of them. Um, the other uh, major issue that the men mental health program that we have tackled during the pandemic was a lawsuit against our um, both mental health state agency as well as our um, correctional agency docs. Um, we discovered that people were being held um, in um, prison past their maximum sentence, meaning that they weren't, they had served all the time that they were supposed to have served. Um, or they were being denied parole um, into um, and out of, I'm sorry, out of the prison setting because of a lack of mental health housing. Um, so people were spending years past their sentence in jail because the state did not, um, was not able to offer them mental health um, services. Um, after filing a lawsuit, which we are collaborating with several other nonprofits and a private law firm on um, the state immediately then um, uh, dumped people from the prison into homeless shelters instead of providing uh, mental health services, which uh, results in um, people often ending up right back in um, jail and prison because of um, parole violations, um, but also um, serious um, uh, concern about the health of the people who don't have access to mental health services and have just been essentially given a bus ticket to New York, the middle of New York City and wished well. Um, we, uh, we are still litigating this uh, case, but we have um, survived what's called a motion to dismiss. The, st the state tried to get rid of the case saying that really there is really no there there. And the court wrote a a fairly scathing decision, about a 60 page decision, um, using some really powerful language, including calling the practice um, ableism by the state um, and um, and other types of you know language that I think will have a national impact that other um, uh, legal practices that do this work can cite to to show that um, that the state can't simply say, oh, well, we don't have enough. You need to wait in prison. Um, while um, while we try to develop it. Um, for those of you with some familiarity with this type of um, Americans with Disabilities Act type of case, which is often called an Olmstead case, uh, a um, unnecessary institutionalization of people, um, 
the this was kind of one of the first cases that tested the theory that a prison can be an institution that people are unnecessarily segregated into as people with disabilities. And so we hope um, we know that our mental health population are are much more likely to end up in jails and prisons because of a lack of mental health services in the community and a lack of investment in the community. And we're hoping that by holding the state accountable for, for that type of end result, that, um, that they can't simply dump people in jails and prisons and um, not account for them when they need mental health services in our communities. Um, our peer program is the um, large, it's the, the most sought after program. So the most number of people are eligible for that program. Because like I said, to be eligible, you simply aren't eligible for our IDD program and aren't eligible for our mental health program. So that means everybody. So even if you have a developmental disability, if you don't meet the criteria of our IDD program, you are pair eligible. If you have a mental illness, but you don't meet the criteria of our mental health program, you're pair eligible. So you can see where this sort of funnels everybody into this program. The majority of the work though that we do in this program are with people with sensorial disabilities or physical disabilities. Um, and so um, uh, at the beginning of the pandemic, one of the major concerns that we had, we had two issues. One was that the governor was not providing ASL interpretation during um, his um, national emergency press conferences. And so we sued the governor and we, we got a favorable decision saying that the the state was violating the Americans with Disabilities Act by not providing ASL interpretation. Uh, that case went on to um, bolster a case against um, the United States and um, and ultimately um, the US press conferences ASL interpretation was extended to um, to those um, cases as well. Um, it's hard to believe, but there were, was not case law supporting the premise of being entitled to ASL interpretation under the ADA prior to this uh, lawsuit. Um, most states simply did it and were doing it during the pandemic and had been doing it because they recognized an obligation under the ADA. Um, but this was one of the first cases that, that um, established in a case that there is an entitlement to it under certain circumstances. The other thing that we challenged was the state's ventilator allocation guideline, and this is a lawsuit that's still ongoing. Um, it's actually ending up in, appeal, in an appeals court right now. Um, the Department of Health issued policies which, which um, rationed ventilators, if you think back to the beginning of the pandemic, about how, um, how concerning it was to have access to a ventilators and the lack of access to ventilators. Um, our clients weren't able to enter healthcare settings if they had personal ventilators because the policy allowed the hospital during rationing to remove their ventilator, personal ventilator, and allocate it to someone else. And so there was a great fear of accessing healthcare services um, during the pandemic because that was the guideline set by New York State. Um, through the litigation, um, I, I'm happy to report that we did not have a case of a person um, having their ventilator removed. Um, but their failure to plan for this is what this case is about, that they need to have an emergency plan that's more effective and isn't discriminatory. Um, uh, and removing someone's personal ventilator, we have said, is discriminatory. Um, our PARP program is the newest um, program. And, um, and in this uh, PARP program, uh, I described some of the, during my other presentation, some of the work we did, but a lot of it um, centrals around these reviews. Um, and you can see the numbers of reviews on this um, screen, about you know, 130 of them were, were started, 155 of them were completed. So you can see the vast number of um, reviews that we did. Also under this program, we developed fact sheets about the economic impact payment. That was a very confusing process for a lot of our clients. And it meant that they didn't get access to funds that they really did need during that period of time. So the program really directed resources towards that. Uh, during this, um, this 2020 report, we also, um, the TBI program focused on, um, P on um, former service members who have traumatic brain injury and created a toolkit called the Upgrading Discharge Status. So many people 
who are service members um, are who have traumatic brain injury often get dishonorably discharged or other than honorably discharged because of behavior related to their traumatic brain injury. And um, if they are able to demonstrate that the behavior is related to a tra uh, uh, disability, they can get something called a discharge upgrade. And the critical component of that is if you have a discharge other than honorably, you don't get access to VA benefits, including you know, health benefits, um, something that is very critical for people with traumatic brain injury to have access to, and they're sort of locked out of that system, even though they served. Um, so this toolkit was kind of put in place. And the second thing that um, our TBI program also did was um, put together a coalition of um, advocates to challenge New York State's absentee ballot program during the COVID-19 pandemic. Many people relied upon the absentee ballot program to vote, um, but people who have um, print disability who can't use pen and paper to vote were not able to use the system because the absentee ballot was not accessible. So after filing a lawsuit, um, the um, against the New York State Board of Elections, we were able to successfully in June of 2020 um, settle the lawsuit and obtain um, a ballot marking um, uh, delivery system that is statewide now that is being implemented over the next couple of years so that um, that that um, a person that is interested in voting by absentee can get an accessible ballot to be able to vote and return. Um, I will note that we had to engage in um, further litigation after settling because the state was not on their timelines for delivering this. It was supposed to be delivered during um, the um, primary election this season. Um, we believe that they will have it fully in place by the November election, um, uh, but we had to seek court intervention to compel them to get to that timeline. Um, the voter access program, as I said earlier, works really on that accessibility um, voting. It does not engage in litigation. It engages in community outreach and education. Um, this program, some of you may be familiar with it because we sometimes partner, goes out to poll sites and ensures that they're accessible, um, writes reports about the accessibility or lack thereof of accessibility of poll sites. Um, so if you are having a concern with your um, poll site, please report it to DRNY. We also file what's called a HAVA, H-A-V-A, complaint, um, and that allows um, a uh, if a person had a barrier to voting, that allows an investigation to be done and often can result in some systemic change within that poll site. So if you use a ballot marking device and that ballot marking device fails while you're trying to vote, you can submit a HAVA complaint. Or if you're given, um, you're asked questions like, um, explain your disability in order to use this um, ballot marking device or if people aren't treating you in the way that you need to be treated in order to vote there's all this process to be able to put in place of that um, uh, have a complaint we successfully um, advocated for that complaint process to be more accessible to our clients and transparent so that now it operates very clearly and there's a whole process to it and we can get a decision at the end of it and the counties then need to follow up with the decision that's issued by the state board of elections so i encourage um, i tell this to all of my staff and i'll tell it to you i encourage you even if you don't um, require a ballot marking device in order to vote. If you're going to your poll site and you're voting at your poll site, I encourage you to use the ballot marking device there. It's, um, we have lots of videos about how to use it, but it'll, it's very intuitive. You put your ballot in and it's a touch screen and there's lots of accessibility tools that you can use in order to access the marking of the ballot. The ballot gets marked by the machine and you put it into the, um, the ballot counter the same way that every other ballot goes into the ballot counter. Um, so I'm going to stop sharing my screen now and kind of open up for some questions. Excellent. Thank you, Jen. Um, so if anyone has questions, you can put it into the Q&A box and we'll uh, read them out loud or feel free to raise your hand and we can unmute you as well. I think, um, Jen, as you know, you know, centers do a lot of information and referral too. So I think it was helpful to hear 
you know, probably the percentages of what you get calls about is similar to independent living, but it helps give a sense of when it makes sense. You know, I think centers do what they can. And then it gets to a point with some individuals that they need, you know, they need legal assistance. So, um, you know, you guys would be the next stop at that point, I think. Yeah, and the other thing that I didn't mention here, though, is that we do provide kind of technical assistance to the centers, too. So if you have a legal question that you're trying mm -hmm. to advocate for someone, um, we can provide kind of general information. If you um, if the person wants help from us, though, it, it does help to have that person contact us, because even if we can start the intake process, um, as I said very early on, we're we're client centered and we need to create an attorney client relationship, which yeah. which becomes confidential then. And so even though we very much appreciate the referrals we're getting from you, often our first step is to get right back to that client yeah, and contact with our client. Um, we do have a way to um, schedule an intake too. So I have the, the telephone number that I put up there. There is an online intake form as well. Um, if if it helps to have the client in your office and schedule to do the interview, um, we have a process for doing that. You should get a live person when you contact us. Um, you know, 99% of us, we pick up the phone, we want the live person to be able to be there. That's a, that's a commitment that we have dedicated resources to that's very important to us. Um, so if you are getting the person and you're transferred to the intake um, person who's going to conduct the intake and you're at their voicemail and you're having trouble kind of connecting, the receptionist that answers the phone can set up an, a scheduled interview time. Oh, the time that works um, and that works with the intake specialist to make sure that we're not playing phone tag. Um, and so and we, we hope to continue to expand that kind of scheduling block. Um, because the, our, like a lot of our resources are sort of dedicated to the person calls us and then we're trying to chase them down to, mm -hmm. to do the intake. And sometimes that happens with your referrals too. So if somebody is telling you that no one got back to me, we've often chased them down and we're unable to connect with them. Please reach out to us if someone is saying that there is trouble getting in contact with us. We will schedule a time. We, we take those kind of complaints very um, seriously, because we don't want anybody to feel like they can't get in touch with us. Um, and, and the other thing is I, I want to kind of share is we can't share the confidential information that, the, that we've said with the client without some authorization from the client. So if the client is telling you one thing and you're reaching out to us to say, is that true? We might not be able to tell right. you anything, but if you reach out to us with the client's consent, then we can talk to you about what's happening. Okay, good. Looks like we've got two questions here. Um, as an IL center director, how can we best connect folks with your services or inform the general public? So the best connection is, is to get that client to the intake. Um, and there, it's really the client's preference on how that intake is connected. So if you if the person really is looking for direct assistance from us, it can be a telephone call, it can be an email, it can be the online intake form. Um, and so that's the best way to connect it to us. An, an individual intake is created for that person. A, a lawyer assesses the case of whether we can provide the assistance or whether we're gonna refer the assistance. Um, a sample issue, consumer is disabled, her parents are her landlord. They want to evict her from her apartment. I mean, I don't know if I'm going to give legal advice here, but I would <laughs> say that I would want that person to reach out to us. That is not un I, unfortunately, that is a fact pattern that we sometimes do here. Um, but here's the other thing. I, I just as a general matter, sometimes the client is very concerned about it, but the client when educated about what their legal rights are and what they would have to do to enforce their rights are unwilling to do that. That's their decision. And we mm -hmm. We respect their decision. So if a landlord is your family trying to evict you, there are processes to protect yourself against that eviction, but you often have to bring the landlord into court to protect yourself. And so the family may be un the individual may be unwilling to do that to their family member. Um, so so then we're often referring people um, to other non-legal options that isn't us getting involved. Um, you know, short of that, sometimes you, we, we write letters to landlords that say, you can't do this. You have to follow a certain process for eviction. Um, and some, some clients don't want us to write those letters if they're family members. Finally, I will say that there are many legal service agencies that are, um, that are contracted to provide 
legal representation through the eviction process. New York has a push towards right to counsel in housing matters. So certain jurisdictions have a right to counsel. We do not, um, we do, we supplement, we do not supplant um, legal services that exist. So if you are entitled to counsel somewhere else, we won't provide direct representation to you. We sometimes provide technical assistance to that counsel on the disability related issues, but we, we definitely are gonna to wanna to target you to those places that provide, that are contracted to provide the right to your counsel in housing matters. Um, and they do exist across the state. And fortunately for New York State, they're expanding, which is really great because housing is a major issue for our client base. Um, someone asked, how do people with disabilities apply for assistive technology? So um, if you're talking about our services and asking for help to get it, um, there's a legal barrier to getting assistive technology, you can call us or intake. But assistive technology in terms of funding it comes from many different resources. It depends on the fact pattern of the person. So our VR agencies, if you have a barrier to employment and you need assistive technology in order to get access to employment or maintain your employment, our um, Access VR, Commission for the Blind, they fund assistive technology. There are other uh, trade centers that also provide some access to assistive technology. Um, you know, a, a modification of a car is assistive technology as well. Our agency for people with ID and DD have uh, vehicle modification or home modification grants as well. It really depends on kind of who the client is, what services are they already eligible for. We don't provide assistive technology. We advocate for the 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 and for the person to access where the assistive technology might be available to them. I have to honestly say though, there are people that are ineligible for any of these programs. There is, you know, barriers to mm -hmm. financial barriers to accessing assistive technology. But we do also educate people on low cost assistive technology that may be able to assist them um, you know, versus high cost, um, if that becomes um, an issue. So someone asked, is this the type of issue you provide legal services, but there's no context to that. So um, it, whoever that submitted that question, if you want to uh, raise your hand or just do a follow up. And then someone asked, um, do you guys support help persons with dementia being forced to sign documents? Yeah, so our, um... Our a pair program, individual rights program. This is this is an issue that we are starting to, um, you know, see. Well, we see in our really in our um, nursing facility work, um, as well as our guardianship work. Is the um, um, you know we've had people that were being forced to at, to sign documents to stay in nursing facilities from some family members, and other family members are like, no, they can come home. So there's a lot of dispute around that population. There's often a lot of opinion from family members about what the right um, source of care is. It really does come back to that individual directing or representation. So if they're you know we we sort of try to peel away the family and have this direct connection to the person with a disability and find out what they really do want. And that sometimes means we have to go to where that person is and meet with them and speak with them. Um, and then we often can appear in cer certain types of legal proceedings to say, this is the type of relationship we've been able to develop with the person. This is what they want. And then, you know, uh, the facility or the court or whoever it is, you know, sometimes respects that, you know, independence from the family conflict yeah. that's happening. So yeah, if you are seeing a person with um, dementia, feeling like they're being um, either exploited um, by having to engage in some type of signed document, um, feel free to connect them with us um, uh, and, and, and we'll evaluate, you know, whether we can provide direct representation under our resources. Um, someone, Jorge, asked, I work with the Ticket to Work program with participants in other states. Does every state have a disability rights department? Every state, so the Ticket to Work does have different elements um, uh, that's funded. Every state has a protection advocacy system. The way that you often find it is putting the words disability rights before um, uh uh, the state name before disability rights. So our disability rights and then the state name. So for example, disability rights, New Jersey exists. Uh, disability rights, Vermont exists. If you're I'm doing the ones around here, um, <laughs> Massachusetts has one as well. Um, there, I think they're called the disability law center though. So it's a little hard to find, but if you wanna go to the national disability rights network, ndrn.org, you can find the disability, the protection advocacy system in every state and territory. 
Okay, great. And then we're just about at two, but we have one last question. Um, do you help disabled owners with abusive tenant issues? I found here in Buffalo, all the programs help the tenants, but not the owners or landlords. We don't distinguish between tenants and owners. So if it's a disability related issue, I would have the person contact us. Again, it's about resources, it's about priorities, and it's about figuring out whether they're entitled to representation elsewhere. But we don't have, you know, it's possible we could have a conflict, the tenant already called us, so we can't help you. But we don't have a, um, a limitation on, on what type of posture the person with a disability is in, in order to provide representation. Okay, excellent. Well, thank you very much, Jen. Um, thank you all for joining. We will have a recording available for those that want to reference it, or if you have staff in your center that you think it would be helpful for. Um, we'll be sure to link the um, the annual report, which I think is excellent. I've been uh, scrolling on it on my other screen here, um, and the slides will be available as well. So um, thank you all for joining, Jen. Thank you for your time. Thank you for having me. Thank you to our 2022 webinar series sponsor, Waymo. Waymo is an autonomous driving technology company with a mission to make it safe and easy for people and things to get where they're going. We believe that fully autonomous technology holds the promise to improve road safety and offer new mobility options to millions of people. This is why we're designing Waymo Driver, our autonomous technology to give people a new kind of freedom to go where they want, when they want, while making the frustrations and concerns with driving a thing of the past. Logo fades into view. New York Association on Independent Living.